Hello everyone, I'm Deacon Pedro and welcome back to our continued series during this time of COVID-19, Faith in a Time of Crisis. Right from the beginning of the crisis, one of the biggest concerns, especially for Catholics, had to do with the closure of churches and the cancellation of masses. Now, two months later, we're beginning to see some dioceses reopening their churches and resuming uh, masses, and one of these uh, dioceses is the Archdiocese of Vancouver. And so today we will travel to British Columbia, and I'm so pleased to have Archbishop Michael Miller of Vancouver joining us today. Archbishop Miller, uh, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Pedro. Good to see the folks on Salt Mike. So for people who maybe are not very familiar with the Archdiocese of Vancouver, can you give us a general scope? What is unique? What's different about the Archdiocese of Vancouver? Vancouver, of course, we're, you know, the, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's a, a church that is extraordinarily uh, diverse here, uh, as you might expect, being on the Pacific Rim, very large Asian population. Mm -hmm. And uh, the church is, although not as fast as one would like, the, the church, in fact, is, is growing here on the West Coast. So right. there's, um, it's, not a, it's not a church which is... Um, we're closing, having to close parishes or anything like that. It's on the contrary. It's been, you know, trying to build new churches and new schools. Right. That's that's good. And would you say because of the the Asian population is is mostly a Catholic population? Oh no. I mean the the uh, large numbers, of course, are Sikhs. We have a very large Sikh population oh, right. among the Vietnamese, Buddhist, and Catholic, Filipino, pretty strongly yeah. Catholic. Uh, a fairly good number of, of Chinese from Hong Kong and from the mainland and from Korea. Uh, so, but it's a, it's a mixture, you know, it's still overall, uh, Catholics are still uh, about 16 and 16.5 percent of the population. Okay. But we're the largest single, uh, the longest, largest single religious group. But right. this and is the West Coast, most 40 percent are nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Yes. Yes, yeah, I think that might be similar in other in other dioceses. Um, is it is it a large geographical diocese? It's a fairly large geographical, but most of it most of our most of it is mountainous, and so there are no parishes. There's nothing there. Uh, in fact, it's very urban. It's a long, it's a strip along the lower mainland um, from Vancouver out through the the Fraser Valley to Holton. Mm -hmm. So there's no parish. Well, there's only one parish that is more than an hour and three quarters by car. Okay. okay so you, so it's, so you, it's in fact very urban. So, you, okay, good. I was going to ask you if there were any remote areas. There, there are a couple of remote areas. There's uh, Powell River. You can get there by little plane when I go. It takes 28 minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> but if you go by car, you have to go on and off the island. That's right. it. And do you have a large indigenous population? Um, there's... Um, a significant number indigenous population, but um, there's more indigenous populations in other parts of, of British Columbia. But we certainly have an indigenous population. There are there are a number of reserves within the archdiocese, and mm -hmm. on some reserves there are still churches. Right. Now, as it pertains to the COVID-19 situation. Uh, I think those of us here, at least on the, in the East Coast, have a sense that British Columbia is is a little ahead of the, the rest of the country. Um, is that true? What are the what are the, what's the situation there it's right now? It's certainly, in terms of the number of cases, the number of deaths, it's very it's very small compared to Ontario, or mm. um, or Quebec. I think we've had I think it's about 140 deaths, right. uh, and we're now down to almost single digits in ICU. And maybe 20 or 30 um, in, in hospitals across the across the province. We were we were early on um, pretty careful about social distancing and so on right from the get go. We have a, an excellent uh, provincial health officer in Dr. Bonnie Henry. Yeah. And and so we've been uh, fortunate, and now we're um, gradually opening up our schools across the province. Were opened yesterday. For a limited number of students, um, more being allowed in the primary school than in secondary, and so on. But there, um, 
and only about maybe 20% of the students actually are returning. It wasn't obligatory, but this is a sign of, of reopening. And our parishes, or any place, not just parishes, but uh, we can have gatherings of up to 50 in a single space if we can guarantee physical distancing and proper sanitation. Right, right. So, so that's a little different than the rest of the country. Did you, I guess, in the last couple of months, did you also have similar restrictions where it went that, like, at the time when you were closing the parishes, uh, were there restrictions up to five people? Uh, uh, as in other places, we never, we never really had. Um, there were no provincial restrictions on the number. It was simply deemed prudent not to, to um, offer masses without a congregation. Okay. Uh, Churches did not have to be closed. Some uh, some churches closed because they couldn't guarantee um, proper sanitizing, you know, and cleaning. Right. Uh, others remained open, but not for public mass. Okay, so for personal prayer. Um, personal prayer, they were open, and of course the priest would be where it was offering mass every day, but without a congregation, or maybe with one or two people who right. you know, worked in the you... office or, uh, and so on. Right. Did you find that you also had to have certain restrictions uh, around other liturgies, like funerals, baptisms, weddings? Yes, we could, but we had we could have funeral. But most we recommended that, uh, except in an emergency, that there not be baptisms. That the Easter vigil baptisms that were planned, and there were over 400 planned in the archdiocese, were yeah. to be delayed. They're now being done in these days. Um, funerals could be held with, you know, as long as the number was restricted. Right. The British Columbia was very sensible in not singling out churches um, for any special uh, restrictions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, I, I would imagine that it was would have been a difficult decision to 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 cancel masses. Did you get a, 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 a pushback from parishioners, or did you hear? Some, but, but most people in British Columbia, because it was such a united effort, realized that. Uh, it was imprudent at the time to have gatherings of a significant number of, of people. Right. And um, of course, there were some people who uh, were disappointed and um, even said, you know, we should continue. But most people were um, glad. And in fact, when we now are reopening churches, we see that there's a, a number of people who still who are feel that they should not be going to church, even though they're open. Right, of course. Well, there's of course. a lot of um, compliance with the directives from the Ministry of Health. Um, was there a good uh, relationship or conversations between yourself or your, your staff and government officials to... We, there, were, there have been three um, conference calls with religious leaders, not just Catholics, religious leaders across the province with the Premier, the Minister of Health, and Dr. Bonnie Henry, the Public Health Officer. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, mo mostly they were, um, you know, asking us to be very, to be very prudent in, in what we did and so on. But they weren't heavy handed in laying down what churches should do. It was okay. just seeing that the general instructions for all gatherings in public places were being observed also in our, in, in our, in, in our churches in and temples and mosques. Um, and I imagine, Archbishop, that you, with your either the Council of Priests, would have had meetings and and deciding what was the best way to re resume masses. How was were those conversations? Well, we had some. We had obviously not with the whole body of priests uh, because you can only zoom so many. There are two hundred priests in the archdiocese, mm -hmm. uh, but um, there's a lot of good material that's available, uh, particularly uh, from, from the United States where they've done uh, research on how, on how to do this. So with priests, but al also with others um, on staff, yeah. guidelines were uh, developed on how to implement the um, reopening of masses with a congregation. And mm -hmm. there were also a second set of guidelines on the liturgical uh, requirements for reopening. Mostly they have to do with um, physical distancing, which everyone here is is now very used to in public places, and um, ensuring cleansing and proper uh, sanitizing of the environment. 
Right, there's and and a I've lot seen... of small things too, but that's mainly what it has to do with. Yeah, yeah, and I, I've seen those guidelines, and I actually would like to talk, talk about them because all of us here in the rest of the country that are are, are looking forward to opening churches and resuming masses are, are curious to know how similar our guidelines are going to be. Um, you decided to leave the resuming of masses at the discretion of the pastors, correct? Is that what you Because uh, for several reasons, most places have done it. We also knew that there were some parishes uh, or a few parishes that uh, it would be difficult for them to ensure proper sanitizing. Most of their volunteers and so on are themselves vulnerable people. A couple of places, perhaps the priest felt himself to be um, vulnerable and we did not think it was prudent to force yes, uh, right. force the celebration of masses in, in, in such places. Of course. Did um, you, sorry yeah. to interrupt, sorry, did you phase out, sorry, did you phase in masses in that you allowed weekday masses first and then Sunday masses? No, uh, a, a couple of parishes did that. We gave a start date that they could start on Sunday the 23rd. Mm -hmm. which was Ascension Sunday. Um, I would say about half of the parishes began that day. A few parishes decided to opt to, to begin on Monday to see how it would go. Um, and other parishes said, well, we'll wait and we'll do it on Pentecost. We need a little more time to get supplies to organize how we're going to uh, sort of arrange the assignment of the maximum number of people and so on. Yeah, and the maximum number you said was 50. That, was, that 50, was a number. Which includes air, apps, you know, priest servers, any everybody. musician, any anybody who's doing live streaming, it's 50 people in the space. So it's right. probably about uh, 42, 42 parishioners. And the, but that's not contingent on the size of the space. If it's a no. small sanctuary, I guess. No, I, if you can't, if it's, um, if the church is too small, although I don't think any of our churches are too small to, for physical distancing for 50, but if there right. were, a place, then you have to ensure the physical, the two meter yeah, physical distancing. Some, Did, some places are much larger. They could physical distance and hold 300, but the government has been very clear. It's not a percentage. We want 50 because we believe that's a number for which we could do con contact tracing were it necessary. Right. Yeah, of course, that makes sense. Um, and, and did parishes, uh, did they set up a sign-up system? Do you know how most parishes are? Most, are yes, of course, in nearly every parish, it was a sign-up system. They, they used different methods. Um, we had a template if they wanted to use it. Some, most of them did a sign-up. They did sign up because we had, they needed, but how they did it was up to them, whether it was email, whether it was phone, a combination, using the template that was made available by the archdiocese and so on. Mm -hmm. Of course. And would you, did you see that any parishes had to add extra masses? In yes, order some to... parishes have chosen to add extra, have chosen to add extra masses or have masses in another gathering space. Uh, that, that would be, for example, we have in Vancouver, most of our elementary schools are on the school property, on the parish property. Sometimes there are even distinct parking lots. And so they would have two spaces where people could gather it. If there's a, a pastor and associate, they could both be celebrating mass at the same right. time. Um, however, the dispensation uh, yes, for the that dispensation obligation is, is, still, is still in effect and will be until effect. such time as the churches are completely open. Okay. Because as soon as, whenever you have any restriction, you can't impose an obligation. Yeah, of course, of course, because um, there'll be people who will be, as you said earlier, that would be concerned or afraid, or they live with elderly people or people who are afraid. Right, there are, and we, in, in the instructions, we advise some people very strongly that they should not come. Mm -hmm. Of course, you yeah. can't stop yeah. somebody, but it's very, it's advised there are right. groups of people that should not come to Mass at this yeah. time. There were two items in your in your guidelines that that I had not thought about, and one had to do with the length of mass. You're suggesting that masses should be shorter, and the other one had to do with music. Can you explain those two? Right. I think part of the mass is being shorter recommended is that we know that it's um, the length of time in in the congregated space that has to do with the possibility of um, the virus spreading, right. and music. They say, you know, it's all about droplets now and that music and opening your mouth in song, uh, particularly loud and gusty song, um, the number of droplets released into the air is very yeah. high. And right. so it's best 
not to encourage congregational singing. Right. And in fact, many people are wearing masks anyways. Right, and I was going to ask you about that. So the province has not required the no, use the province, of masks. The province here is very, we don't have to wear masks outside. You don't have to wear them. Um, I'd say the church, maybe two thirds are wearing them. You can go mm -hmm. to the grocery store, maybe most people, but not everyone. Right. Physical distancing is where there's far more concern than mask wearing. Yeah. I think the, the biggest concern or the question that a lot of people have is regards to distributing communion, receiving communion. What sorts of, how did you figure those? I mean, those there are liturgical and canonical concerns there. So can you right. explain? Well, we certainly um, highly recommend, of course, receiving communion on the hand, which is by far the the most common practice and um, we rec uh, what's recommended is that the person because they're at six or two meter intervals that when they approach the 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 priest that at the six at the two meter limit the priest will say the body of christ the person will answer amen and then come forward and receive so that there's no they're so not they're breathing not on each other, other at the time yeah. of uh, of reception of communion. Mm -hmm. A few places have um, kind of plexiglass, you know, sort of a, a screen, and the person would put their hands up, kind of through the, the a, a bottom hole. But right. but not everyone does that. Oh, so so some parishes in Vancouver have done that with the plexiglass. Yes, the cathedral we have that. Uh -huh. yeah. we, However, we put it on the on the communion rail because we have a communion rail yeah. and okay. just installed it and and. Uh, People can use that either for the hands or there's one if if one's receiving on the tongue. Okay, but receiving so on the tongue, to, you have to sanitize after each after each after each communion after each communion. Whereas on the hand, only if there if you actually end up touching the the hand by by the right. Stake. So if there are, and I know in my parish, for example, I know I know I can tell you exactly who the parishioners are who who want to receive in the tongue. And I suppose right. that they could be instructed to go to uh, on a separate line to the yeah, Oh yes, and that's definitely a separate line. You, and we also suggest a younger a, a younger priest or extraordinary minister or deacon. Right, right. But there's so no. Would you need... that? Are you the young, and the younger Carl Pedro? Yeah, <laughs> not 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 so much anymore. Okay. Um, uh, but there's no requirement that the Eucharistic minister has to sanitize after each. No, after not after minutes. each. If it's on, if if, he, if there's no contact, there's no reason. You know, you can when you put it on the hand, you kind of actually drop the host. Right. I know but that there were some it, concerns. Then you, then you do sanitize. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, masses resumed in Italy, I know there was some concern because the Italian Church uh, instructed priests to wear gloves while distributing communion. Can you explain a little bit about about the concern with that? I can't see any 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 particular reason for wearing gloves. I find, I think. Touching the host with gloves, I find not the most desirable and un un unnecessary practice. Right. Yeah, I think so. And it's, it's just yeah. not necessary. We, we don't do it in, in public places. I was at the hospital yesterday and people are not wearing, are typically not wearing gloves, even in the hospital. Even to distribute communion in the uh, hospital? I don't think that they're doing I think we, we, we very much discourage the wearing of gloves. Right. Actually, since you bring up the hospital, because a lot of the questions had to do with the sacrament of anointing, I mean, you have to touch the patient. With, 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 then you can you can wear you can wear you can wear gloves. Okay. For the, for the sacrament of anointing, in a way that you don't when you're used for confirmation or the or, post baptismal or ordination. Yeah. And I guess, uh, and I and I understand it. The priest cannot be wearing gloves during the time of consecration. Oh um, no, there's no, there's, they say if, if, if you're doing physical distancing, there's no reason for that. It's like you don't wear a mask if you're yeah. six feet apart, but it's just, nobody recommends that. That's right. Overkill. Okay. Are you suggesting that Eucharistic ministers or priests while they're distributing communion should be wearing yes. priests? We say mask. it's advisable, but not necessary, but it is advisable. And we're suggesting that communion therefore not be distributed after mass. Okay, can you explain that? How does that work? Well, it's because of the length of time that it takes for communion, you know, when okay. there's people are approaching it's at six feet. And also that during the actual celebration of mass, it is, I think it's more fitting not to be using a mask, but afterwards, and you can take off your chasuble. 
um, right. which is also a further safeguard, and you can distribute Holy Communion just with an alb and a stole. Right. And, and, and there and, are and norms in the... Nothing and, and you're putting a table out, and it's just, it, it would, I think, unduly lengthen, and it's not necessary. You can distribute Communion right after, at the end of Mass, you just exactly. go to the sacristy, take off your chasuble, and, um, you know, sanitize your hands again and, and go out. Right, exactly. And there are already norm, liturgical norms in place that allow for that. Of course. You can always yeah, of course. Um, wow, this is this is really, really interesting and really helpful. I, I presume that the rest of the country, as we phase in uh, opening of churches, here in Ontario, churches have been closed completely, even for personal prayer. I um, Yes, I, I don't know how a government can actually mandate that. I find that on the government's part, I mean, you know, to mandate, it's one thing for the common good to join in an effort, but to mandate yeah. the closing of a building, boy, that seems to me to be excessive. I would have thought that they would say it would be a good idea if you did this, and then people would... And then leave it at the discretion. Would, 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 yes, and, and people, I think, you know, we voluntarily comply to serve the common good if that was yeah. seemed to be necessary, but... Um, mm -hmm. I guess... Um, one, one thing that priests all over and bishops, I imagine yourself as well, have been discovering the art of live streaming mass. Oh, yes, we sure do. Um, there's, um, there, are, there are challenges there, but I, I presume that there's also have been great opportunities in terms of finding ways to preach the word. Right. Yeah, we, we certainly do it. I've been live streaming. At the, I've never said so many masses in the cathedral uh, Sunday after Sunday. This is usually confirmation time, as you know, and um, it, it's it's. Uh, we're getting we're getting better at doing it. I think about mm. more than I'd say about sixty percent of our parishes are live streaming masses on yeah. Sunday, at Wonderful. least one mass, yeah. uh, and um, some have it. You know, very good. They haven't really worked out. Great cameras, terrific sound. Others, it's a little shakier, but people do like to see their own pastor, their own church. You know, nice. that's I think that's a great consolation. Yeah, there is. Have you, you found could watch that? Salt Light or you could watch yeah, Aaron exactly. or Hulk. But yes. people like their own, you know, this is their space, their church, yes. their community, their priest. It's and, true. It's true. Um, uh, have you found that as a as archbishop, you've had to to communicate more with the people, pastoral letters, uh, messages, maybe video? Well, yeah, there's, um, yeah, there have been, I think there have been three kind of, interviews you know that have been videoed i certainly the um the mass of the cathedral there's you know several thousands always for for that following that and we've just launched um a new website called behold okay. which we are adding to our proclaim website uh behold is it's a terrific um, tool for uh evangelization that we launched uh, two days ago on pentecost sunday which so, is a new tool for uh, communicating with, with, with folks in the archdiocese. It's, it's called simply beholdvancouver.org. And it's, uh, it really, it's, it's worth, worth taking a look at. Oh, good. Yeah. Maybe not, not just for people in the archdiocese of Vancouver, but no, no, it has a lot, of, it a lot of really good, good material. And, and we've had lots of um, our marriage prep, our new divorce and separated um, okay. Catholic. Um, they're all, it's all online. We've had, you know, retreats online, talks online, and in, to many of those, there have been far more people than we would have had in a parish hall or an auditorium. So mm -hmm. there are some people have learned a lot to, uh, about, you know, being online. It doesn't yeah. replace the real thing, but yeah. just like online giving has yeah. <laughs> picked up, thanks be to God. It is. I know that has been quite the learning curve for a lot of us. Yeah. Um, it's been a difficult, a difficult couple months for for a lot of people. How have you found that you? How have you been encouraging the people of the Archdiocese of Vancouver? I think well, we've been encouraging them to remain engaged with their with their parish. Um, that it, in many parishes there are a lot of uh, online opportunities for learning, for outreach or uh, gathering together, things like Alpha Online, the CCO uh, Faith Studies Online, all of these are um, still going ahead. 
And so I think there are there have been many opportunities that people um, uh, take them. Um, mm -hmm. One of the yeah. bigger challenges has been schooling online. We have that's all in place, but you know, for many parents, that's been a challenge if they're at home trying to work and they have three or four children also needing computer time and so on. Yeah. Um, but there's been a lot of, I think, um, communication, mm -hmm. which keeps things going. I know that there's um, everybody though misses. I mean, we're sacramental people, yeah. and everybody misses the real deal. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. But at the same time, I think this has been you know a, a kind of a desert experience where we've we've it's i think it has been an opportunity for people to strengthen their faith it, it has uh, and i think it, there's been more quiet time more prayer time i think for a lot of people because their social activities have been really cut to a cut to a minimum mm -hmm. nobody was going out uh, much and and so on so it's it's been an opportunity but it's also been a, a challenge, particularly for people who are alone or confined, uh, were confined in a rather restricted space. You know, yeah. a lot of apartment dwellers, and that's that that that's been a greater challenge. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, at the same time, uh, maybe someone like you has found that, that you're busier than you thought you would be. I am because I have the blessing of being able to come yeah. to an office every day. Yeah, and. Um, have a be able to celebrate mass here in our chapel yeah if i'd been stuck at home i think I, it would have been much i would have found it mm -hmm. much tougher but, yeah but i have here the cathedral and home to go to i haven't i've only been to the grocery store once so <laughs> yeah so what, what would you say maybe in closing uh what how does michael miller keep you know hope during this time how did what keeps you going well, I guess I never really thought that that, that, that the situation was hopeless. <laughs> you know, the the, uh, the society and the church. I mean, we've we've had it pretty good uh, for a long time, and that, that there's a, a bit of um, you know difficulty, challenge, at best, suffering in our way. I mean, that's 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 part of human life. That's part of of uh, of. Um, I think that we should expect that, that everything was always going to be sort of on a upward trajectory. Somehow, I frankly never really believed that anyways. Yeah. So I never thought of this as hopeless. I thought of yeah. this, as no, a, that's, this is a time of, of, of trial, perhaps of purification at best, you know, if, if we can do that. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's hopeless. And yeah. by world standards, it's not so bad. No, but that's it's, true. And it's really, it, it, there, you know. Yeah, certainly not for us here in North America. Oh, no. um, Archbishop Miller, it's been a great joy speaking with you. And it's been really interesting hearing how uh, things have been developing in Vancouver. Uh, so thank you for your words of inspiration. Thank you. And, oh, and thanks to, to Salt and Light for the encouragement you give to all of us to live our faith. Thank you. You're welcome. That was Archbishop Michael Miller. He's the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Vancouver. And as you heard him say, he joined us from his office in Vancouver. And that brings us to the end of Faith in a Time of Crisis this week. Remember to continue visiting our website, saltandlighttv.org, for more articles and videos. But more importantly, remember to continue finding your faith during this time of crisis.